to the brave men and women who stood up for freedom, who answered the call and fought for our nation, who paid the ultimate price and never came back. To the American soldier, we thank you. To the mothers and fathers who raised a hero, to the brothers and sisters with an empty space, to the sons and daughters who have only memories, to the wives and husbands who bear the void with pride, to all who've lost a soldier they love, no gift could repay your sacrifice, no tribute could match our admiration, no word can contain our gratitude, but still, it deserves to be said, we remember you, we salute you, and we honor you today. Tomorrow, early Memorial Day. Uh, thanks for all the veterans, just anyone who served, anyone who has served that may not be here. Thank you so much for your service. Uh, I was just, you know, had a little time to think about that and to remember, you know, there's so many Christians around the world who don't have this awesome freedom that we have to worship our God without any thought of persecution or what's going to come. So I think it's something that we should really remember, not just one day a year, but we should remember throughout the year as well as we get to come here every Sunday and out loud throughout the week as well, praise God and give him glory, whereas there's so many people around the world who don't have that freedom. And that's all thanks to people who do go around and fight for our freedom. And sadly, some of them lay down their lives for that. But it's something that we can't appreciate enough and can't thank God enough for. And uh, we know Jesus in John 15, 13 says that there's no greater love than to lay down your life for those you, or for your friends. And that's something that we really should remember, like I said, because there's so many people in our community and in our country who have fought and died for us so that we can sit here and so we can live a life of freedom and so that we don't have to wake up every morning in fear about what's going to happen. Uh, the early church had to deal with it. So many people throughout history have dealt with it. People now deal with it. And so let's not take that for granted. But thank you all to the veterans again. So let's pray real quick before we can start worshiping. Lord, I just want to say thank you for this day. Thank you again for all the veterans that you've had a call on their lives to defend this country and to give us the freedoms that we enjoy all through your sovereignty, and we appreciate that so much, God. Uh, I thank you for each and every single one of them who has laid down their lives or just served in any capacity. Uh, we very much appreciate that, Lord, and I pray that we can love them in return in many other ways. I thank you for everybody who's joining us today. I pray for you to just speak to them, whatever uh, Pastor Doug's got to say. I pray that you can just guide us to know what you'd have us know and guide us to a knowledge of you, God, and an obedience to you and a faith. So we love you, Lord. I hope you enjoy this praise and worship. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Will you stand and join us this week?
every prayer we prayed in desperation the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear and in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our
very sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on that cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin and sings my soul my Savior God church today. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're joining us online. What a beautiful day, and we get to be out in it today, by the way. If you are available, we have been asked to carry the big flag in the parade for Crosby Township today, and the flag is almost the size of our auditorium. <laughs> when I say big flag, if I remember right, it's a big flag, so uh, we could use some help. We need about 15 to 20 people uh, we're going to meet at the uh, Crosby Township this community center around 1.30 or so. The parade starts at 2. Uh, if you're able to help, we could sure use your help. If you're watching online, we would love for you to come and help us as well. Uh, you can come. You can do that if you're not able to stay for this, the service. We understand that as well. But uh, again, this, the parade begins at 2, and then uh, we'll be carrying. It's a pretty short parade. Uh, but then we'll be carrying it, and there will be a memorial service immediately following that. So, uh, again, if that's something you're interested in, put on some walking shoes and come and join us at, uh, at 1.30 at the Crosby Community Center. We're here today because God is good, and we're here today because He deserves to be worshipped. We're here today because He is great, and He is awesome, and we're going to be talking about that this morning. And let's come to Him in prayer and just thank Him for all that He is. Most holy God, we want to thank you so much for who you are, for all of your love. God, we want to thank you for what you do for us every single day. I want to thank you that we look out today, we just see your beauty as we look out the windows in our auditorium, and we just see a beautiful day. We see the sky, we see the trees, we see grass, we see, you know, so much, and it's, it's all your creation. You did all of this, and then 
we look at the people sitting next to us, and you created man, you did all of that, and God, I'm so excited to talk today about, in the beginning, kind of what you did and, and where this is all going, and Lord, I just pray that as we worship you today, we would just pause and remember who you are, we would just, just pause and look around and just see you in everything that you created. We just love you today, it's in your son's name we pray, amen.
possible. At this time, we'll dismiss our children for Children's Church and uh, have a seat. We're so glad that you're here joining us today. Um, we're beginning a new series, and uh, you know, as, as you you know, as you as we look at the Bible, I, f- I find that we tend to spend most of our time in the New Testament, and and it's so cool. We get to look at the life of Christ. We get to look at the church. We get to see all that. It is so applicable to our lives. But, you know, we're we're never really going to fully understand the New Testament. We're not going to fully understand the life of Christ and why he came and the significance that's there unless we understand where we came from. And and so if you're confused about the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, that's probably pretty normal. But we're going to take some time and we're going to go through and we're going to we're going to start at the very beginning in Genesis chapter one. We're going to hit. Not every story, of course, in in the Bible, but we're going to hit some of the key stories, main stories of the Bible, that will really help us understand better the whole reason for Christ. And and so this morning, we're starting at the beginning. We're going to look at the very first verse of the Bible. I was kidding. If you've ever been in in a small group with me, I tend to kind of crawl through things, you know? (laughs) And so this morning, we're going to start this whole story of the whole Bible and we're only going to get through one verse. But, but don't worry, we'll move a little faster once we get on from here. So, so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. And what's going to tell us, it's going to answer some very important questions that if you just start in the New Testament, you're going to miss out on. And these are things that we, we, we probably know, but let's go back and let's think anyway. It's going to answer the question, where did we come from? It's going to answer the question, why am I here? It's going to answer the question, you know, is this all an accident and random chance? Um, Are we just evolved animals or is there something more? Is there purpose and meaning in life? Um, Why does death feel so wrong? You know, why do we care if something is good or something is bad? You know, as we go through and look at these things, we're going to see that what exists exists not because it evolved, but because God created it. This foundation is so important in our understanding of who we are. You know, you're not an accident. You were created on purpose in the image of God. You were created on purpose for a purpose. You are here for a reason. And I think that's so important that we grasp that because it changes our whole viewpoint on life. You'll find not only your purpose, uh, you know, it, we find our purpose through our, our Creator, through our God. We don't have to feel like life has no meaning. It, it, it does. It, it's, it's, it's so cool to look and see. So what we're going to do, we're going to do something in this, in this, this morning that, it, that I've done in Bible studies before, and many of you may have been through before too. And it's, it's a, uh, there's a Bible study method, it's called the Discovery Bible Study, and, and it's really cool because you kind of start and you look at one verse. You say, okay, if this verse was all I had, what would this tell me about God? What would this tell me about people? What would this tell me about myself? How should this affect the way I live? You know, just a few questions. You just look at this. And, and, and now we're going to expand. We're going to look at more verses than just one verse. But I do want to stop and really drill down on this very first verse of the Bible because God sets the tone for, for everything else right here. Let's read it together. You probably heard it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, all right? So that's, that's nothing new. We've, we've heard that verse, but it's foundational. So let's start. What does it tell us? It tells us first that there was a beginning. In the beginning, right? There was a beginning. So let's read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now we have to understand, this, this wasn't a very popular view uh, until just really more recently. There was this mindset in, in our world that everything just always existed. In fact, to say that it had a beginning, you know, sometimes you were kind of scoffed at, and, and Christians in particular, you, you look at this, this notion of this, this idea was the world always existed, there was an infinite past, and whenever you look at evolution, that was something that evolution really needs because statistically it's pretty much impossible for evolution to happen unless you have an infinite amount of time. Now think about that. I th- I, I've read some, you know, th- some examples about how what would explain that. Think about a monkey sitting at a typewriter, all right? 
So uh, does it look like anybody you know? Don't point, all right? So, so think, think of a monkey sitting at the laptop, right? And uh, he just starts pounding on keys. He starts typing, right? So just think, how long would it take a monkey to just randomly type out, just think about something like Charles Dickens, you know, Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And how long would it take for him to sit down and just pound out on keys to get that book exactly right with the plot and everything, everything all the way through, you know, all, all the way, you know. So just think about how a day, take longer than a day, right? Um, you know, a year, uh, not likely, right? Uh, you know, it, 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 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. And what they're basically saying is that this, this, while it's so incredibly unlikely and nobody would believe that a monkey could sit down and just type out a tale of two cities perfectly punctuated and everything, you know, nobody would ever sit down and just come to that on their own. But if you throw the word infinite in there, then all of a sudden you think, okay, but if it's infinite, that means that there's an infinite number of possibilities and, and maybe, maybe that's possible. And that's kind of the, 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 the direction that evolution, evolution took. And so, so now this really cool thing has happened. And we've talked about it at our church especially because I kinda, it's interesting to me. But science is kind of caught up with the Bible. And, 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 I, and I like that because we now know and, and science knows that the universe had a beginning. And it's, it's kind of cool. You know, we, we've done studies on it. But, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, one of the implications of that was if there's an expanding universe, then, then if you play that backwards, it comes back, it all started as, at a point in time. And so, so now then, I, everybody is it's pretty much universally accepted that the universe had a beginning. So we've come back to this, this idea that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there's a beginning, right? Now, the next thing is we look at this, this passage. It says in Genesis 1.1, it says that God existed before the beginning. Now, think about that. God existed before anything existed. That's kind of the definition of God, one of the definitions of God, right? So Genesis 1.1, if we take this verse again, so in the beginning, the universe has a beginning, God was there. In the beginning, God was there, and he created the, the heavens and the earth. So what does this tell us about God? So it tells us, that God exists outside of time, space, and matter. Our universe is comprised of time, space, and matter. So as we think about this, it's one thing to know it, but what does that mean to me? That the universe exists, that God exists outside of our universe, outside of time, space, and matter. I, I think it's crazy. It, it's crazy awesome that he exists outside of time. Before time existed, God was. What does that mean? It means he knows the past. It means he knows the future. Um, there was this movie years ago, and I'm, I know I'm really dating myself, but it was called Back to the Future. You ever, have you heard of it, Back to the Future? Really kind of cheesy movie, right? But, but there is this car, a DeLorean, which you guys have never heard of, right? It's a stainless steel car that, that was really cool. Doors opened up. It's this real futuristic car. And uh, somehow this, this wacky professor turns it into a time machine. And so it, it's interesting because one of the things that happens, I forget which there were sequels and everything. I, don't, I forget which one it was. But one thing is that happens is they go to the future, right? And um, he, he tells himself his past self, to remember Apple, you know, or Microsoft. I forget which one it was. Because if you knew in the future, if you could go back and knew what's going to happen, if you could have bought some shares in Apple, or you should, could have bought some shares in Microsoft, or you could have bought some shares, you know, just think how rich you would be if you bought shares in Amazon or Google. I mean, who knew? Right? Not me. But God did, right? And so... Think about that, about how awesome it is that God knows everything that's going to happen before it happens. Wouldn't you want to know somebody like that? Can't you just imagine how helpful that would be in our lives if we had somebody in our life who knew the future 
who knew what was going to happen? Would we want to listen to him? So we have to ask the question, can God really know what's going to happen? I mean, we know that the church answer is yes. But, but it's, it's interesting to look. In the Bible, we call them prophecies. And, and, and what you're going to read, as you read through the Old Testament especially, you read through the New Testament, you're going to see lots of prophecies. A prophecy is when a prophet from God would stand up and say, this is going to happen, this is how it's going to happen, sometimes maybe when it's going to happen, but he makes this prophecy about something that he could not possibly know, and then it comes to pass. And one of the ways to determine whether a prophet was really from God or not was God says, if somebody stands up and, and, and makes a prophecy and it doesn't come to pass, you don't have to listen to him because he's not from me. I know what's going to happen. I'm not going to get it wrong. So, so, so God does this, and he, he, there are all these prophecies throughout the Old Testament. We're going to look at some as we go through the series. And the, and the cool thing about it is, is that so many of these were fulfilled that this is one of the evidences that people use for the existence of God. All right, so, so can God really know what's going to happen? Yes. And these fulfilled prophecies in the Bible are often used as evidence for the existence of God. Anybody can make the claim, but, but, but God has backed it up. So think about this. It means that when you have a relationship with God, you get to talk to him, right? When you have a relationship with God, you can ask him for wisdom. You can ask him for guidance. You can ask him for, for, for a piece about, is this the right job? Is this not the right opportunity? Is this the wrong opportunity? God sees beyond your interview. God sees beyond that, that, that first year. God knows long term what is going to be best for you. And we can come to him and we can ask him and we can talk to him about those kinds of things. He knows the outcome of every choice we could possibly make. And we can trust him when we walk on his path. Just think about how many pitfalls we could avoid if we listened to God and had this relationship with him where we let him speak to us and, and we listened to him. And he actually, just think about how awesome your life could be and how, much, how many problems could be avoided if we knew somebody who knew the future and God exists outside of space, time, and matter, and he sees this timeline. We're stuck on this timeline. We live on the line. God steps away from it, and he sees the beginning, he sees the end, and then he sees eternity beyond that. That's who God is. So we have access to that, and that is powerful, right? So the first verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a beginning. God existed before the beginning. And then we, we realize that God created everything that exists. That's what he's saying. God created everything that exists. Let's read it one more time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right? So let's look at the days of creation. I threw up a kid's graphic up here, right? So Genesis chapter 1. We're not going to read all of Genesis chapter 1. But, but I encourage you to take the time and read through it. But it describes the, the days of creation. On day 1, it was earth, space, time, and light. That's day one. On day two, God creates atmosphere. On day three, God creates dry land and plants. On day four, sun, moon, and stars. On day five, the sea, sea creatures and flying creatures. And on day six, land animals and man. And we know that on day seven, he rests. All right? So that's creation. So in the beginning, now if you think about what that means, that means that's the beginning of everything, right? God creates everything that we see. And God, Genesis tells us that he did it in six days. Now, what kind of a day was it? Let, let's read Genesis chapter 1. It says, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. This is the first day, right? And there was evening and there was morning the first day. All right? So how does he find a day? He defines a day as evening and morning. Let's go on, Genesis 1.8. On the second day, God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Evening, morning, second day. Let's look at the next day. Genesis 1.13, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. The next one, Genesis 1.19, there was evening and morning the fourth day. Genesis 1.23, there was evening and morning, and it was the fifth day. 
Genesis 131, God steps back. He looks at everything that he's made, and he says it was very good. And there was evening and the morning, and there was a sixth day. So as we look at creation, God creates days. He defines them the same way we do today as evening and morning. In the Jewish day, their day began in the evening, by the way, and not the morning. We kind of have it backwards to what they did, right? But, but so evening and morning, first day. So God creates everything that we see in six days. And so what this tells us, it tells us, first of all, that God is way different than we are, all right? I mean, we can't create something from nothing. We can't do what God did. We can't create a sun. We can't create stars. We can't create trees. We can grow them. We can, we can take care of them, but we can't do those things. But there's a difference between being the creator and being the created. And we are God's creation. And where we get messed up from the very beginning is where we lose that relationship and understanding of who we are. When we try to become God, instead of letting God be God, and we decide we're going to make our own rules, we're going to do it our own way, and, and we can just be our own gods, we'll answer to ourselves, we, we're placing ourselves in a position that, that, that we're not qualified to have, right? So if you think about how amazing what God did, I mean, I love our church, and I, and I love it right now, and I realize probably not much longer are we going to be able to do that. Um, but look around. Look out the windows over here on the side. Look at the grass and the trees and the sky. And I know that sometimes when you get bored during my sermons, I know you're looking out this window. Right? <laughs> I know that when birds fly by, I know, I get it, I've done it too, all right? So, so I, but, but the cool thing about it, I love the fact that we can see God's creation. And the problem that we have that I think, I think is fairly new to our generations, this, this, this past, is that we've gotten so much busier than the generations before us. We don't, we don't take time to stop and just think. We don't take time to stop and just, just meditate and do nothing. you got to realize, you know, in our generations, I mean, the, the, the TV came along. Every spare minute of our time is, is spill, spent on our phones, uh, on the TV, on the computer, you know, or, or doing our jobs. But how much time do you spend just not doing anything? You see, guys like David and, and guys like, you know, they're living out and they don't have the schedules that we had. And so they turn in at the end of the day and there's no TV to watch, there's no phones to look at, there's no email, there's no work to catch. It's, they would sit and they would look, and they look at the sky, and they say, wow, you know, this is pretty amazing. They would look at creation, they would, they would, they would do things that I think we miss out on, and they, they saw just how awesome the heavens were, right, that God created. Interesting statistic, you know, it's, it's light travels about 186 thousand miles per second per second all right so to put that into perspective jump on a plane fly to the west coast what four hours something like that right light in one second will travel the circumference of the earth what, seven times something like that in a second it takes like two seconds to get to the moon uh, that's fast <laughs> you know, if you have, that's fast. It takes light, traveling at the speed of light, it would take four and a half years to get to the nearest star. Our nearest star, right? To get to the edge of just our galaxy, and there are galaxies and galaxies and galaxies. It would take traveling at the speed of light 1.9 trillion light years. We get caught up in our own little lives, and we get caught up in our own little communities, our own little worlds, and, and we, we sometimes forget just how immense God's creation is and what he did 
when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Get out a telescope, and you're going to see a God. Get out a microscope, and the more you drill down and the more powerful it is, you're going to see God, right? And it's so cool how unfathomable God is. We could never fully understand who he is or his power and how powerful he must be. That's why Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. He's saying, look around. He's everywhere. We're just not looking. It says they have no speech. They don't use words. No sound is heard from them, the stars and, and the sky. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God pitched a tent for the sun. You know, Psalm 8 says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of them? What are human beings that you care for them? So in the beginning, we see a God that is so crazy powerful and so beyond what we can think or imagine, and it's intimidating and scary. It can be. How do you relate to that? But then you read this passage, and he says, what is mankind that you're mindful of them and human beings that you care for them? We see that that God who did all of those things, cares. He cares about you. And he cares about me. John 3, 16. Let's just read a couple verses. We know them, but for God so loved the world. That God, in the beginning God, that God, so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Psalm 139, to me, is, is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Because I still can't really grasp it. But it tells us some really cool things about God. It says, Oh Lord, you've examined my heart and everything about me. Stop. Right? You've examined my heart and everything about me. That God, the in the beginning God, that God cares about what you think. He cares about what's in your heart. He knows what's going on. He knows everything about you. That God, the in the beginning God. Right? He says, you know when I sit down or stand up, you know my thoughts when when I'm far away. That God knows what we're thinking. And he cares. He says, you see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. That God, the God who created the heavens, the God who created the earth, that God walks with us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to live in us. That's amazing, right? He says, you place your hand of blessing on my head. And then David says, when I stop and think about that God, the in the beginning God, caring that intimately about me and wanting to know me personally, he said, this knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too great for me to understand. Isaiah 41, 13 says, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. You, you, you know, as a parent, if you've had kids, you know, you, you know that there are times when they get scared, you, you reach down and you hold their hand, right? So they'll be safe, so they'll be okay. Maybe when they're walking across the street, always, you know. And that God, in the beginning, God says, for, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, don't fear, I'll help you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You see, What does all this mean? This first verse of the Bible sets the tone for so much in our lives. It tells us how big God is. It reminds us that there's nothing he can't do. As we look at it, it's just powerful. And when we have problems, 
or we're going through difficult times, or we don't know what to do, he wants us to know, I, I, I can help you. I, I, I can reach down and take your hand. I want to. Cast all your cares on me. I, I care for you. That God is big enough to handle anything that comes your way. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget. We can turn to him when we're afraid. We can turn to him when we're desperate. We can turn to him when we need help. We can turn to him when we need to be loved. We, we can turn to him when we just need somebody to care. And that is so cool. So this first verse is setting a tone. Now let's, let's drill down a little bit more. So if there was a beginning, that means that God created something from what? Nothing, right? I, yeah, that's an easy thing to say. God created something from nothing. That's an easy thing to say, but how do you do that? I mean, we, we can't relate to that. But there was a moment where there was nothing, and then there was a moment where there was something. And create literally means to bring into existence. So, so Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made of what was visible. God made something out of nothing. Romans 4.17 says, This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing. Now, I know that that sounds crazy, right? I know that it sounds crazy. I know that people will say, do you actually believe that God created something out of nothing? And by faith, I'm going to say, absolutely. And then you can turn to ask them, well, then you tell me how we got here, Right? Because if there was a moment where this began, how, does, how was there nothing in this something? What's your explanation? And the reality is, is what's happening today in our scientific community is they're redefining the word nothing to actually have, be something so there's something to start with. It's crazy to me, right? It's absolutely crazy. Psalm 33, 9 says, He spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm, Right? I told you a story. We've got vacation Bible school coming up. And by the way, if you want to sign up for VBS, there's a sheet in the back. We could use some help. Um, it's coming up. Be here before we know it. Uh, it'll be coming up in July. But, but at vacation Bible school last year, a teacher was sick, and I wound up uh, getting to help, and, and I really enjoyed that. But so I, I took in, we talked about this kind of, this, this kind of this subject. And so I had, a, I had a couple of digital cameras at work. I think I told the story. And and we don't use digital cameras at work anymore. Everybody uses their phones. And so I, I, took, this, I took one camera and I left it alone. I took the other camera. I took, took it completely apart. Circuit board, semiconductor, ev ev everything, you know, resistors, you know, everything. I, everything, I, I just took them all apart, right? And so um, I, 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 I took it all and I put them in a box. And then we talked to the kids about, you know, do you think that, do you think that if you could, if you shake this box, let each kid shake the box, and do you think if you shake it enough times, it will turn into this, a camera that works? And they were like, oh, no, that's, you know, that's crazy, blah, 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 right? But that's not even the point. The point is that God started with an empty box, right? I mean, we, we, can, we can come back and we can, we can put chemicals in, in some place or, or we, can, we can try to recreate, do some of the things that God did, but we're always starting with something. And the reality is, is that our God in the beginning created something from nothing. And, 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 and if we think about that, God has the ability to make something from nothing. Think about that. If he could do it in creation, he could do it in our lives too, and I believe that he does. He fed 5,000 people and 4,000 people with a few loaves and a few fish. How did he do that? Because John chapter 1 says Jesus is in the beginning, he was involved in creation, and it says that God created something out of nothing, he just did it again and everybody saw it, Right? How did water come from a rock? 
for the nation of Israel when they were, when they were dying of thirst? Where did manna come from that the children of Israel ate in the wilderness? How did God do the things that he did and the miracles that he worked, Jesus, when he walked on this earth? Because he's able to take nothing and make something out of it. And, and when you think about that, yeah, that, that means a lot. I, there are times, I, you know, you've probably experienced these too. There are times you go to pay your bills and how did that happen? Sometimes I think God took nothing and turned it into something, you know, and, and, and made the ability to do that. We've seen God provide here at our church, we see God provide in your lives where he does it. He just shows up and he does it. Where did you get the strength to face that crisis? You didn't have it. God takes nothing and turns it into something. Where, where did you get the strength to go through this relationship issue? God takes nothing and he turns it into something. He could take what you have and make it enough. He doesn't even need what you have. That's the God that we serve. And if he can create something from nothing, then nothing is too hard for him. And Jeremiah thirty two seventeen says, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. Nothing is too hard for you. I love that. All right? So let's look at the next point. So as we look at this, God creates something from nothing. And then as we look at going through chapter 1 and we see about what God created, God just didn't create a bunch of stuff. It says that everything God created was good. G G Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Then and it goes on and it says, uh, Then God said, Let there be light. There was light. And God saw the light was what? Good. All right? Verse 10, second day. Um, God called the dry ground land and the water seas, and God saw that it was what? Good, right? He does that each day of creation. He tells what he created. He looks. He says, this is good. And then in verse 31, it says, Then God looked over all that he had made on this last day, and he said he saw that it was very good. And the evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. So when we look at creation, God created everything good. So we look around, and is everything good now? No, it's not. I wish it was. It's not. It will be someday, right? But we're going to see in a few weeks why it's not good. It's not good because we took what was good and messed it up. That's what sin is. And that's what sin does. So the reality is that, that, that we break God's creation when we don't do it God's way. God's way works. And, and, and when we mess with God's way, it never turns out well for us. But, but if you're looking for good in your life, you need to follow God's plan for your life. Because everything that he creates, everything that he does is good. It's who he is. All right? He tells us over and over in the Bible what his plan looks like. He tells us over and over in the Bible what is good. He tells us over and over in the Bible what is wrong, what is bad, what is sin. What will tear you down or what will build you up? He's already told us. We just need to listen. But it's, it's even bigger than that. God not only created all things, he sustains all things. It, it, as you look at this, Colossians chapter 1 says, All things have been created through him and they were created for him. God created everything and it's, it's for him. It's for him to use. It's for him to do as he pleases. That means the world. That means our lives. That means everything. He's the creator. He has that right. He says he's before all things. He is number one. This is all done for his honor and for his glory. And in him, all things hold together. He keeps it together. Have you ever felt like you couldn't keep it together? Have you ever felt like you just want to just, just fall, it's fall, fall apart? If God can hold the universe together, he can do that in our lives pretty easily. He can reach down and take our hand and say, I want to help you and help you keep it together. Psalm 75.3 says, when the earth and all of its people quake, it's I who hold the pillars firm. He's the one who kind of holds us and says, it's going to be okay. I'm here. 
I created something from nothing. I can handle this. Lean on me. Talk to me. Do it my way. Watch and see what can happen. It's powerful. And the last thing as we look at this morning is that the purpose of creation is to point us to God. When we look at this, this, everything that he created and the beauty, you know, Psalm 19, we just read, it says that the heavens declare the glory of God. He, he, he made, he could have made, why did he make everything color? It could have been black and white, maybe it would have been easier, I don't know, you know. <laughs> why did birds sing? They didn't, you don't have to sing, you know, he could, there, there's so many things, there's so many things that you look at creation that God did just for our enjoyment. You know, I remember reading an article about taste buds. There's no scientific reason for us to have taste buds. If I ate Strong's Pizza yesterday, and I was so glad I had taste buds, you know? <laughs> Everything that we do, if we stop and we slow down and think, it points us to God. And the purpose of creation is to bring glory to God. Psalm 148 says, praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord for at His command they were created. God created the universe so vast, I believe, so vast, so he, we could understand just how vast He is. Did He need to create multiple galaxies? If it takes, what is it, 4.9 trillion years to get the edge, edge of the Milky Way, traveling at the speed of light, did God really need to create galaxies beyond those galaxies, beyond those galaxies, beyond those galaxies? He could have just stopped just, just our little universe here, right? I say little, it's not little. He could have started with our, with our galaxy, you know? But he shows us the immensity of who he is. It, it's pretty cool. You see, Romans 1.20 says, Ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. I, I, I just, I don't understand. It's, it's, not, it's not as hard as we sometimes make it. We know that this all had a beginning. We know that there was nothing, there was something. You, you by faith, have to, you have, to, you have to explain that somehow. How do you do that apart from God? Why would I not place my faith in God who's not only told us, shown us, revealed himself to us, proven it. I mean, just, why would we not? But, it's a, but if we think about it, creation is God's billboard. And if we just look, we'll see made by God all around us. It's crazy to me that we'll let people who have many titles behind their names intimidate us when a child can look and see that there are things that we can't explain apart from God. Right? God tells us that only a fool can look at creation and not see him. Psalm 14 one says, the fool says in his heart there's no God. Hebrews 11.3, it says, by faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible right? This whole thing is an issue of faith. Where did you come from? Why are you here? Is there purpose and meaning in life? Is this all just meaningless? It all comes from your starting point. And that's why in Genesis chapter 1, he starts and he lays a foundation that is so solid for us, and it can change our whole perspective on life if we stop and think about it. We look around and sometimes we're made to feel ridiculous because we say in the beginning God created, but how ridiculous is it, ridiculous is it to have somebody say, well, there was a beginning, there was nothing, there was something. I mean, how do you explain that, right? I, I, I'm going to close. There's a series of quotes that I've, I've used several times from Lee Strobel's book, uh, The Case for Faith, uh, The Case for Creation. And Lee Strobel was an atheist. If, you, if you're familiar with the story, he was an atheist. His wife becomes a believer, and he's not happy about it. She's going to church. She's changed. She's, 
and he, he's an investigative reporter, and so he thinks, you know, I, I'm going to do a, I'm going to study this. I'm going to break this down just like I would if it was a, a, a case that I was looking at or a trial or whatever. I'm going to explore this. So he begins to talk to the experts that you and I probably wouldn't have a lot of access to, to, to try to prove to his wife. He starts with the resurrection, if he can th- throw out the resurrection, and, and he becomes a believer in the process. But listen to what he said. Because I, I, I repeat this a lot because I think it, it sums up so much about what we're made to feel ridiculous about. He says, looking at the doctrine of Darwinism, which, which undergirded my atheism for so many years, it didn't take me long to conclude that it was simply too far-fetched to be credible. I realized that if I were to embrace Darwinism and its underlying premise of naturalism, I would have to believe these things. That, well, it's like I, that nothing produces everything. Think about that. Is that reasonable? That non-life produced life. Have you ever seen that happen before? That randomness produces fine-tuning, which is a whole interesting topic to talk about. That chaos produces information. That unconsciousness produces consciousness, and that non-reason produces reason. I don't think that's, you know, I, 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 he said, he continues on and he said that he just didn't have enough faith to continue his atheism. You see, God God didn't create everything leaving us to wonder. He created everything and it points to him. There's so much there's so much that it tells us about our God. It tells us that there was a beginning. It tells us that God existed before that, so he knows everything. It tells us that he created everything that exists, so it's his. That means we're his. He's God, we're not. We shouldn't try to be. It tells us that God created something from nothing. And there are times, frankly, where you and I need that in our lives. There are times, I mean, it tells us that everything God created was good. So if I want to do things God's way, if I want good in my life, I'm going to do things God's way. And we see that all of creation points us to God. So Genesis chapter 1 starts off laying a foundation that everything else that we're going to read about builds on. Now, I know this is something that we probably know, but it's something that I'm sure we probably need to be reminded of. You serve a big God. He's bigger than anything you're facing in your life. And he's able to handle anything. He's able to take your nothing and turn it into something. Nothing's too hard for him. And he's not just powerful. He reaches down and takes you by your hand. And he says, I'll help you. And that is so cool. God sent Jesus so we could have a relationship with that God. Now, you may be here, you may say, you know, Pastor Doug, I, I, uh, I don't have that relationship. Well, I'm going to tell you, you want it, right? And I want to invite you to give your life to Christ today. You may be here and say, Doug, I know all that. Well, I'm glad that you know all that. But do you live like you know that? Or do you deal with stress? Do you deal with fear? Do you deal with anxiety? Do you deal with... Do you worry about things that really you don't have to worry about? We can trust God that if we follow him, he's good. He'll guide us. He'll direct us. He'll take care of us. He'll give us strength to do what we need to do to get through the things we have to face. He loves us, and it's amazing. We get to be his children. We get to be the child of the in the beginning God, and that's powerful. Let's pray. Most holy God, I want to thank you so much for our time in your word. I want to thank you for 
for what it means. Um, God, too many times we, we know things intellectually, but we don't think about what they mean in our, in our everyday lives. And I pray that what we know would intersect with the things we come into contact in our lives and that we would just recognize who you are and, and lean on you and trust you, God, and just thank you, God. Thank you for not just creating everything, but creating everything in such a way that we're, we're drawn to you, we're pointed to you. And God, I know that this morning there are needs that are here, there are needs of those who are watching online that, that are beyond anything that we can do, but they're not beyond you. And this morning we give those to you. I pray for those who may be just kind of exploring and checking all this out, God, that, that, that today would be a day that they would start looking around and decide that today's the day they're going to play their place their faith and trust in you. God, that their lives would be different for, for all of eternity. God, you know our needs, and we're just going to give them to you today. May we take a few moments here and just recognize you for who you are and, and just say thank you and glorify you and praise you because you deserve it. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I can invite you just to stand. And uh, this is just our time to remember that God is God, right? No matter where you are or what you're going through, God is God. This time is yours. thank you so much for being that God, Lord. A God who can do anything for being all that and caring about us. Uh, we'll never fully understand it, but we do want to just stop and say thank you. God, may we just give you the praise and glory that you're due. Help us to realize, God, that if we want good in our lives, we'll do it your way because that's all you are. We love you today. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks and be seated, and thanks for joining us online as well today. Um, just a couple of real quick announcements. First of all, uh, Vacation Bible School sign-ups on the table in the back, or if there's a sign-up genius, you can go to our weekly update or to our website, crosbcc.org, 
and just click the sign up button and um, you can sign up for whatever area you would be willing to to help in we need people to be in charge of areas and then we need people just to help uh, you know jenna signed up for crafts this year uh, normally i just go ahead and sign her up but she she signed herself up this year and uh, uh there are a lot of kids who have glue and stars and crafts that they're trying to make and their fingers are fumbling around. They need help. So you may not, you don't have to, you know, maybe you said the person says, I, I can't teach or I can't do this, but I can help in this way or I can make, I can listen to kids say Bible verses or I can give them prizes or I can hand them treats or I can, there's so many ways that we can help. Um, if there's something you're interested in, uh, sign up, or you can see me, or you can go to the website. That would be fantastic. Flag football uh, is June 12th, and so sign-ups are also in both of those places, the weekly update and, uh, and also online at, at our website homepage there as well. Um, and then last, our parade today. Um, what a beautiful day to get out, and, uh, and uh, it's, I thought it was cool that the that the, uh, the community asked us to be a part of this. If you're able to help, we could use your help. It's a pretty big flag. And uh, if there's a gust of wind and it's just a few of us, we may just wind up someplace else. So <laughs> we'll see. So, uh, you know, if your kids want to be in a parade, bring them. You know, it's, they can come along and, and hang out as well. It's just going to be a fun day. So, again, if you're able to come and help with just that, come if you need to leave. I understand that people are busy and things going on. That's fine. If you want to stay for the service, that's fine as well, of course. So uh, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for everything you do. Uh, let's look around today as we have one of these beautiful days and just remember that God is God. Let's stand to be dismissed. Lift up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of His faithfulness forever. King of the victory, the hope of the world, the Savior has risen, the Spirit has come to free us into love. Forever, oh, we are the people of God with the freedom of hope in our hearts. Our greatest the love of the Father. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next week.